I'm Deb Sinkis from Palm Street from Raleigh. There's several of us walking around today. Um, look for the logo and you will find our people. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is project planning and estimation using user stories. Who here has used user stories before at all? Okay, good. So I don't have a bunch of agile purists in the room, which is really good. Because <laughs> I'm going to turn around and tell you to do things that aren't really like agile, but it just takes the benefits of the user story approach that Agile has and helps you look at doing requirements a little differently. Now you can use this that I'm going to teach you about um, for any kind of project. You do not have to be a developer, okay? So this is good for you whether you do web design or whatever. You just might have to kind of, in your mind, mentally trans, uh, transpose some of the examples and things like that. All right, so I'm going to start off first by telling you about something about storage of PowerPoint, okay? So like back in 1961, this is Milton C. Shedd, he co-founded SeaWorld. He does not look particularly comfortable in that picture <laughs> with that whale. <laughs> I guess they, they assured him the whale would not bite him. But he still looks like, hurry up, take a picture, get over with. Um, but anyway, when, when SeaWorld was proposed, nobody had actually trained a whale to do tricks at that time. That was an unusual thing. Um, people didn't know much about the ocean. Now, they didn't know really what was underneath there. If you weren't a scuba diver, you really didn't have much of a chance to see that. There weren't the things on TV like Jacques Cousteau and such that you know a lot of us grew up with and saw where we, we got exposed to what's underneath there. So it's a big mystery. So back in 1961, somebody wanted to build a marine park in San Diego, California. There were two competing entrepreneurial groups who were trying to get the award to be able to do this. One of them was a local organization of entrepreneurs from San Diego, so they had all the local connections, they knew all the people, they had the footprint in the city. Um, and they got a lot of the press in the paper. The paper would run articles about um, this marine park that was coming, and they would get most of, the, you know, most of the space, most of the pictures and all that. There was a competing group, group from uh, Los Angeles, and, you know, they really didn't think they had as good of a shot. But each group had put in written proposals, and Shedd's group won. And thus, SeaWorld ended up being born. And there are probably a lot of reasons why they chose them. I mean, they obviously had to have the financials right and everything else. But there was one thing that was in their proposal that wasn't in the other one. There was a story. They actually had, now again, this is back in 1961 when there were 40,000 business books telling you to put stories in your business proposals. This was back at a time when, you know, that was kind of weird. And they had this long narrative in there that followed a uh, middle class family through the park and expressed how they would build the park, what the park would look like, and what the attractions would be through the eyes of the family. So they actually talked about how Junior felt when he rode on the little speedboats, and how the wife felt when she saw the dolphins. And it was obviously very meaningful. Um, it's been quoted and talked about even 50 years later. They won, and their proposal had this story in it. And that's because you can have all the facts and figures, diagrams, mock-ups, and everything else you want, but the story kind of pulls it all together and shows the client that you actually know what the vision is. You actually understand. It's just it's a different way of looking at things. So what we're going to do, and I started off a minute ago saying I'm glad I didn't have any Agile purists in the room. I'm going to take something that is from Agile. Um, at Polish Geek, we've, we've moved more toward Agile. We've always kind of been Agile-like. Like we do a lot of things in that manner. But we actually took our whole core team and uh, stick ourselves in a three-day immersive boot camp for Agile, so we're moving more toward real Agile. But there are still some things that I've been exposed to for years through um, other work and other companies and through the work at Polish Geek that I think can be applied to anything, and user stories is one of them. So I'm going to show you how to do this, but like I said before, you don't have to use Agile, so don't worry about whether you know, you're working with a company that has developers that do or don't want to do it this way. That's not a problem. Um, you don't have to be a developer, and you don't even have to know what Agile is. But I do want you to know that's kind of where this all comes from. So every great story starts at the beginning. So the other focus for my presentation is we're going to be talking about using user stories for the upfront part of the project. 
from when you're quoting it, when you're making a proposal to a client, or maybe you're doing an internal development project. Something inside you want to put together, you want to build, and you need to kind of spec out what is it going to be. What are we going to build? What features is it going to have? How is it going to work? And so we're going to be talking about it just from that perspective, uncovering requirements and prioritizing and deciding what you're going to build. So why user stories? Well, one thing that's important about them is they focus on why you're building what you're building or why you're building that, you know, that website or whatever it might be, that product, that extension. It focuses on why, not exactly what. And it has, it's in everyday common business language. I don't code, okay? I have never, well, I have coded a long time ago, but <laughs> I, I haven't coded in years. Um, and so it's in everyday business language. I can understand it. The developers can understand it. The client can understand it. Very helpful. And it's very relatable. Like, you can put yourself in the perspective of what is this requirement saying to me? What is it I'm supposed to be doing? What is it I'm supposed to understand? It is it's very understandable. And it's also negotiable because it's not worrying about trying to get things down to the exact detail of every tiny little bit of metric about what you're building or what you're delivering. It's negotiable when you get in there. There's more than one way to skin a cat, so to speak. And the user story approach realizes that. So what is a user story? Now, a lot of times on a project, the requirement might be, you know, the site will have a blog. And it will have the ability to comment on the blog, blah, blah, blah. But a user story has a very distinct style. And the style is important because it forces you to make sure you're thinking about all of the necessary ingredients. One of them is, you start it with as a blank kind of user, as a store owner, as an administrator, as a person who's a traveler, okay? I want to do something so that, what's my goal? So let me show you an example. As a user, I want to something so that goal. For example, as a frequent business traveler, I want to book a flight and it says, tell me enough yet? Well, yeah, maybe. I know how to build a flight booking app, blah, blah, blah. But here's the catch. This business traveler is frequent. And they want to book a flight that will minimize their overall travel time. That right there tells you a lot. That one little sentence tells you a lot about what you should be prioritizing when you're building it or putting it together or laying out the interface or whatever. You want to do something that makes sure it shows them Overall, with the connections you have, et cetera, et cetera, your flight is going to take you 6.7 hours. Not just the overall flight, you know, by the time you get the connections and layovers or whatever. That's an important feature for this particular user for this particular project. I want to minimize my overall travel time. So a couple of differences between user stories versus requirements or specs that we might get from a client. They're put in a first-person viewpoint as a business user, I want this, not the user shall, the system shall. No, it's not impersonal, it's not abstract. It encourages conversation. You start talking about that. Okay, so a frequent business traveler and he wants to minimize his time, how can you do that? How would we show that on the page? What would that look like? What other features might that kind of person want? Versus a requirement or spec is all about document every little thing. C Y A. Okay. Um, so user stories, ha you have to go into them with an attitude of I'm open to creativity. There's more than one way to do this versus needing to be exact and precise. And then lastly, they should be independently understood. I, at least from the business traveler one, I get that person is a frequent business traveler and they want to minimize their overall travel time. I understand that. I understand what they want and why. A lot of times requirements, you can't really, like each line doesn't really make sense by themselves. You kind of have to read the whole list and it has to be in context. Um, so one of the goals of the user stories is to put it in something that makes sense on its own that can then be broken out further, of course, into exactly how we're going to do that. So for example, another comparison here is I need a box. Someone comes to me and says to client and says, well, I need you to build me a box. How many times do you get emails from 
client telling you they need something and it's like one line. The first time they contact you, one line, right? A lot of times. I need something to accept Bitcoin. Okay, yeah, you told me what cart you use. Um, <laughs> but we spend a lot of time doing that. Spend a lot of time doing that, trying to find exactly what. Okay, so you need to be exactly like this, and here's your wireframe and everything else. Spend a lot of time on that kind of stuff. But instead, I really think we should be couching things in ways that encourage the conversation. Who's going to use this box? And why do they need it? And what are they going to do with it? Very big difference between someone who's wanting a, even if they say, well, I need the box because I'm a baker, and I need to be able to put my cakes in the box. Really different if they're shipping the cake versus if they're just delivering the cake versus even maybe just the customer picking up the cake. Okay, so different uses, different things. So the user stories drive that whole conversation about why. Why do you need this? What are you going to do with it? Now we're going to use an example project today. And the example project is actually going to be something real to us anyway. <laughs> um, who here, if anyone, has been to our website, Polish Me, and downloaded our big e-commerce comparison chart? Anybody? No. Okay, well, if you're interested, you'll find it there. Um, <laughs> right now, what we have on our website, and I will admit it is slightly out of date. It needs to be updated. It hasn't been updated since like maybe August of last year, so you know, definitely, definitely needs to be updated. But what, I've, what I have done, and what I continue to do, is keep track of what's going on in the e-commerce world. Kind of my thing. And so I have this ginormous spreadsheet. It's like over 350 lines. And each line is a type of feature. And then the columns across there are the carts. Okay, so I have like, you know, Digistore uh, has downloadable virtual products and it's green. But manufacturers, it doesn't have, so that's left out of the way. Well, so I keep this Excel spreadsheet up, and I print it out in a PDF, and I put it on the website, and I make it available for people. That's nice, and people like it. People are like, thank you, you just saved me a lot of time. We would like to do something better. We have an idea to do something better. We want to actually build a cart advisor component that will actually let you tell us, by answering questions, what features do you need? And when you answer those questions, it's going to tell you this cart, or these two carts, or whatever, are the best match for what you just told me you want. So here's some features that we're going to put in this. So I'm going to use this example a couple of times today, so I'm going to go on over this. So the Joomla Cart Advisor is going to present this series of questions, okay, so that they can decide which e-commerce extension most, most meets their needs. And I'm abbreviating that later on in the presentation just to the wizard quiz front end. Okay. That's what I'm talking about there. Then I need a nice report at the end. I'm not talking about something just comes back and says, you should go buy Mijo Shop. I'm talking about something that gives you a report at the end. It says, you know, Mijo Shop was an 80% match for you, and here's why. It had these features you told us you needed. It doesn't have these features. But by the way, well, the ones you said it doesn't have, but there are third-party extensions that do that. Okay, so we're not talking about something that's low value. We're talking about something that if you invest the time in answering questions, which are going to get back is going to be helpful. And so that's a customer report. And then the third thing is I, who currently update this, this spreadsheet, obviously I want to be able to go in on the back end and be able to update that information in the database conveniently to me, a non-programmer. I don't want to have to do scripts. I don't want to have to go on PHP at my admin. I don't want to have to do any of that. I need an admin interface. So there is an internal administration need as well. So user stories. I was telling you about the user stories. I'm saying as a user, I want to something such as this. But a lot of times things are big. Like when I said wizard front end, that's what I would call it epic. It's huge. There's a lot of work in that. There's the questions. There's how the UI will behave. There's maybe some feedback you want to give the user, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Epic is kind of the bucket that holds all that other stuff. Okay, so my Epic in this case would be my wizard front end, and then I have inside of that the actual detailed story as a user I want to do whatever. So this is a screenshot of our very high level Epics from our JCA component work, and it says things like custom report, internal administration, and some orders up there. These are just organizational. 
Go to the very high level. Now, the only reason I'm talking about these is because I'm going to show you later on why you should care. User stories, though, should be much smaller than that. It's very hard to estimate I'm going to build a wizard for an end. Really, really hard. Hard for me to even look at the guys and say, tell me how long this is going to take. I don't know how long. <laughs> too, big to, too big to answer the question. So, like, for instance, these are some of the, the stories in that front end. Okay, so within the epic of wizard front end, I have a bunch of user stories inside. I'll read a couple of off, off to you in case you can't read it in the back there. Um, as a front end user, I want to only answer questions that pertain to my situation. If I'm not going to use coupons, I want to be able to skip it. I want to be able to just put skip and go, right? If I don't need multi store, multi vendor, multi store, I don't want to deal with those questions. So I need to be able to only answer the ones that matter to me. As a friend and user, I want to know where I am progress wise in the application. As a friend and user, I want real time feedback. As a friend and user, I want to be able to pause and save and come back later. I told you that spreadsheet had 350 lines. Now, I'm not going to ask people to answer 350 questions, but if I want to be able to give people the ability to really narrow down on the cart that's the best match for them, I have to at least give them an option. So our thought is, you know, you tell us if you want coupons or not. If you say no, we just move on. You tell us you want coupons, then you have a choice optionally to answer some of the detail stuff. Do you need them by product? Do you need them by this? Do you need them by that? As a front end user, I want to know when to use a tool when it doesn't apply to me. Personally, if I really don't want to upgrade to Joomla 3, and maybe all we've put in is Joomla 3 compatible parts, I want to know that before you even bother starting to use a tool. Right? So we want a little bit of a screening up front to tell people, this is maybe the right tool for you if. Kind of give them that information. And there's more, but that's just a sample of the stuff we broke down. So what's a good story size? I told you Epic is huge, larger than life, it's too big, can't even estimate it, it's too large. So <laughs> the right size that you're aiming for is something that your gut tells you well, it takes about a day, maybe, to two weeks. That's really, that's a, that's a good enough size for quoting and estimating and upfront planning. Remember, I'm not talking about agile development and actually sending people off to code this. I'm talking about you're trying to respond to a client and give a quote. So the client says, I want you to build me a website and blah, 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 and give you the information that they want. If you want something that if your gut says to build that, it doesn't mean to a day, two weeks, you know, depending on the size of the project. Right? And you can build a website that's $5,000, you build a website that's $50,000. They're very different chunks of work. Okay, so that's about right for a story. If you go any lower than that, it doesn't make any sense. If you let it stay too big, that's going to take you more than two weeks, you need to break it down. You need to spend a little bit more time breaking it down. Because if you don't, you're going to have something that's so large that you might not have thought through it well enough to quote it accurately at all. And then, Little stuff, less than a day, it's too small. Don't worry about the minutia, you know? You don't really need to do that. Now, let's talk about a requirement versus a user story with a real example. The application will display a progress bar to the user. Does this look like something you get from a client maybe, or maybe you would respond and give it to a client back, right? Requirement, I want a progress bar. So what that means is you're probably gonna get something like that. That requirement leads to that. So remember I told you that we had a thing of the person using it needs to know where they are in progress wise, but I didn't give you the whys because I didn't want to steal my own thunder. So I've got a progress bar, there it is. Maybe they'd probably be happy with that. Maybe that isn't quite what they had in mind. I don't know, really, can't tell. Let's look at that statement though versus this statement. So I'm a store owner and I'm using the application, um, and I want to understand where I am when using the tool. How are these two things different at all? Anybody got any thoughts? How are those two, two types of ways of positioning the information on the requirement a little different? I'm sorry, what? Staging versus percentage. Stage. Well, yeah, 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 we didn't really say percentage or anything there, but yeah, you might, you might apply that. 
Someone else have another answer? What about what's missing? What's missing? The end goal. Why do you want to know that? The goal! Right! So you might assume you know the goal. We're all, we all take quizzes and surveys and they say you're on question 21 or 40. You're 20% through. And that might be exactly what you think. But what if I give you this statement? As a store owner, I want to understand where I am in the process while using the tool so I can stop as soon as the best cart for me is obvious. Is that progress bar going to help them do that? No, not at all, right? Completely different requirement, completely different conversation. Because knowing why changes everything. The user story drives you to talk about the why for everything on the project. That's one reason why I like it. It makes sure that you understand what the client wants and why. Why are we building what we're doing? Why do you need this feature? So maybe after having that conversation and having that requirement, maybe we come up with something like this. This is one of our ideas, actually. Part of the way through, maybe once you get half, more than halfway through or something like that, we might say, we'll pop up. Based on your responses so far, there's only two cards left that meet your criteria. Do you want to go straight to results? Do you want to keep going? Let people have a choice. Right? Another option that we might choose to do, this is Mikey in here, this is Mikey's favorite, he roots for this one, is actually display on the side as they go which cart is matching best for them with a little button that says, I can stop now and go straight to my results. And actually tells them which carts have fallen off the list. That's a whole different thing than progress bar. That answers a whole different set of needs. Yes? I have an idea for you guys. Well, that'd be great. You see cars.com commercial? Cars.com? Yeah, you see where they, oh, you start with all these red cars. Oh, you don't want those, you don't want those. Just start with the top percentage. 100% still available. 30% still available. 5% still available. Once the percentage gets low enough, all right, let's go see what's left. Oh, there's still too many choices. All right, let's go back. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, do the, uh, you're actually taking that concept and flipping it on its head, right? Say, ah, you, based on what you just said, we've eliminated these. There's now three carts left that we're looking at. Yeah, for they you. can play Guess Who with shopping carts. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. it have glasses? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, how many people here do e-commerce sites? Okay, a decent number of people. So how many people use more than one cart? Uh-huh, uh-huh, four, five, okay? So we, they're complicated projects, right? There, there are a lot to them. And we all struggle with, you know, once you learn one, you're like, oh, I don't want to have to learn another one. So when people are trying to figure out what they should do, what their best move is, a lot of times they just default to, well, I'm going to use the one I used last time. Or I'm going to do, their customers are already on Birchmark, I'm just going to upload an email to Birchmark. Might not be the best thing. This is going to be a neutral way for you to figure that out. So, again, there's a recap of the statements. Notice how we've gone from a requirement that was pretty blah and, you know, very dry. Uh, well, we're going to give you a progress bar to we're now going to give you something that really helps solve the problem of you're busy. You don't have time to answer a bunch of questions. It might not be necessary for you to continue to answer when we already kind of know what you ought to be looking at. Here, you ought to look at these two parts. These are the ones that are right for you based on everything you said so far. So, now, how do you do this in a quote situation? Okay, so there's a couple of steps. First, you have to identify the user roles, and I'll use the JCA as my example for that today. Next, you have to figure out what your epics are. Those are usually pretty easy. You have to build back in, you have to build the front end, you have to build this, you have to build big features. And then you have to actually spend the time to break out and do the user stories and discuss them with the client. Then you have to estimate those. Do you have those cards? When we get to that, I want to make sure I have those. Um, you have to estimate those, and then you quote back to the client at only the epic level. It's the only reason you even bother to put epics in here is because I want to be able to tell you that's the number you give them back. Do not give them back the individual story numbers. Roll it all up, give them that, because that's going to spread your risk. So make sure that you know if you underestimated one, you overestimated another, you kind of have to wash out there, kind of um, rolls it all up. So let's talk about identifying user roles. So when do people, who do you think, based on what I've described to you about this JCA cart, uh, Joomla cart advisor component, 
Who do you think are the people who will use it? Developers. Developers, right? Web develop web professionals. Yeah. Who else? Business owners. Business owners, store owners. And I already said it would be me. I have to update the information in the back end. So there's an admin. That's internal administration. Can you think of any others? Affiliates, like the third-party extension people. Like I'm, I'm saying, I guess for like affiliate marketing or something like that to reference, if you're if you have affiliates with the e-commerce carts, ah. they, may, they may use that. Okay, so I would, uh, yes, and on top of that, yes, too. Also, the other part, which is the cart vendors themselves. Right, cart vendors and extensions. They have a very <coughs> vested interest in making sure my information is up to date once this kind of thing's up and running, right? Right now, my little download thing is not that big of a deal. But when I start putting together something that goes out on the site that says, we're going to advise you on which cart you ought to be looking at, <coughs> I'm pretty sure most of them are. I've already talked to Nicholas at Hit Shop, and you know, he, he's giving me some good food for thought about their perspective. But they're a potential user. Um, Another potential user are people who are currently on WordPress and WooCommerce who have no idea if the same feature set can be available to them in Joomla and which one of all the ones we have should they be looking at. Okay, so I have store owners, web professionals, and the third party extension vendors I had down as a potential user, right? If I told you about, if, um, if a card doesn't do a particular feature but there is a third party extension for it, you know, maybe I want to have them able to use it. But that's too many people to make happy. Not only that, it's also, not all of them are necessary for the success of this thing. The people who really matter are the people I need to focus on when I'm doing requirements. Um, excuse me? Yeah, so I took out right then there, Jim Lee Commerce Explorers, people are like, oh, I want to use WordPress or Drupal, and I'm just curious. No, sorry, I don't need to kind of cater to them. So I'm not gonna, um, I'm not gonna build the thing in a way that is like, assuming you know nothing about Joomla. Um, but I do think the store owners, the web professionals, the admin inside, and the cart vendors matter. And then, I really kind of need to think about it. Is there really much difference between what a store owner and a web professional is going to want out of this tool? Not really. Just gonna want store they're they're going to want the yeah. same thing. They want the result so they can get to the right thing, and then they can produce something back to their client even that says, by the way, here's why we're recommending you go with Media Shop. By the way, here's why we're recommending you do this, because it answers all these needs and shows them. Not only that, I think if you're someone who doesn't do e-commerce projects a lot, just walking through the tool is going to tell you, oh, I should have thought of that. Oh, I didn't ask that. I didn't even think about whether the client wants that, right? So my users I really only care about are three. Store owners, because web professionals are kind of a proxy for them. Policy admin, because we've got to be able to keep the data up to date in the back end. And the cart vendors. And they're in this order priority. So just to kind of give you a little insight, we are actually building the thing in a way that right now we're just kind of shoving the data in the database, not worrying too much about me being able to administer it. It's not a really sexy user interface. I don't care. <laughs> um, we're working more on trying to get that front end and the logic and the algorithm of how we're going to rate the cards and come up with which card is the best match for you, et cetera, et cetera. That's a separate focus on offer. So store owners are number one. If they're not happy with it, no one's going to use it. Nobody else on this list matters. Right? So you want to focus on the user roles most vital to the success of the project. The goal here is not to come up with the biggest laundry list of users. The goal here is to do a little brainstorming on what they are and then eliminate the ones that are just kind of the noise and focus in on are two of these roles so similar that we really need to just put them together and make sure we cover them as one when we're doing requirements. So I end up with three in the Joomla Card Advisor. Then I want to create and discuss all the user stories for all the features for each of those user groups. So you sit down and you have to take your epic, like your wizard front end, and you say, I'm a store owner, and I want to do it. What are all the things I want? It literally is brainstorming. I can't tell you what that is. There's no magic to that, right? You have to figure that out based on the project. A store owner might want to do X, Y, Z. They might want to do this. And then you talk to the client, you get that. Once you get a good set, then it's time to really discuss those. Remember the example of, um, I want to know progress? That, if I went back to them with that user story about the progress, 
So I know, you know, as I'm going through the component that I can bail when my cart thing is pretty obvious, when my result's pretty obvious. I can have that discussion with the client and say, do you want that pop-up? Is that the kind you'd like? Do you want the thing on the side? What would you like? We're going in, so we'll figure that out. But um, you, you, know, you can have that conversation and get to what the real thing is that you're going to build, because this is going to prompt those conversations. Always find out why. Ask open-ended questions. A really easy one to do is always, well, tell me how you imagine this working. Okay, so they say you want to progress. Tell me how you imagine that working. Well, I thought maybe there'd be something on the side. They were kind of telling them which cart was doing what, and then let them know when they can start. Oh, well, that's completely different than a car is burning. Okay? Then you have to estimate the storage. Good card there. One of you just that? Yeah. Okay, right. so anyone who's done any agile might be familiar with these. These are called planning poker cards. Okay? So they literally are a card deck. You buy them usually, there's like enough for four people. So what we end up doing is sit around the room, each developer gets a deck of cards. Product owner or the client representative gets a deck of cards. Everybody gets a deck of cards and uses them to estimate in a group manner. This is not just Donald go off in a corner and come back and tell me how many weeks you need to build this. This is a group discussion. Now, in Agile, they use something called story points. Forget that for today. We're focusing on quotes and proposals and getting back to real clients who have no idea what a story point is and who don't care. Okay, so the, what I'm going to tell you is it's usable by anybody. Don't have to be Agile, don't have to worry about that. Estimating is really hard. Estimating is really hard. How many people here do perfect estimates? <laughs> nobody. If somebody raised their hand, I was going to hire them because that would be worth its weight in gold, wouldn't it? You know, to be able to have perfect estimates, it's awful. Estimating is hard, but you want to leverage team wisdom. That's why more than one person contributes to this. It also keeps you from overanalyzing, so make sure that you are talking about things that matter. And so, for example, let's say that we're ready to estimate a user story. So someone will read the user story off and say, as a user, um, I want to understand what the progress is as I go through so I can know, you know about the cart, blah, blah, blah. And maybe we've already discussed with the client that we're going to do the pop-up. And so everybody goes in their deck of cards and pull a card out. They don't show it to the rest. And then when you're ready, you go, okay, what do you got? Well, I got two. Well, Milton's got five. <laughs> Why? Why did you think two? Why did you think five? What, what is up with that? What's the difference? It's such a such a... You have the conversation. If they all put up the, the two, or three people put up a two, one person puts up a one, you're like, eh, two, move on. Like, it, it's a way to kind of um, get the wisdom of the team, but also to kind of get to, when should we really have a longer conversation about this? If Donald puts up a 20, and Michael puts up a five, I know we need to have a conversation. I know there's something here that either Michael doesn't get or Donald's overthinking. I'm not sure which. I've got to find out by having the conversation. Okay? And it gives room for uncertainty. And I'll give you a little clue here in a minute about why. So, by the way, planning poker cards, I have a little thing at the bottom of my slides which are published. I'll tell you where. Um, but basically, planning poker has a sequence, and it recognizes that the bigger the estimate, remember I was telling you you shouldn't really let your stuff be bigger than about mm, two weeks? That's because the bigger it is, the more uncertain it is. It's pretty easy for me to tell you when I know something, it's probably going to take me two or three hours. Well, probably going to take me two or three hours. Maybe four. But the risk is really small. The extra time over is an hour. Eh. Right? But <laughs> I'm talking about something that someone says, oh, I think it's going to be 40. And then if it's 50, that's a very big difference. That's a much more expensive problem. Everything in the world takes four hours. Everybody, anybody ever heard this line before? From Mad About You? Okay, the wife is sitting there telling the husband, I, I want you to go couch shopping with me. Come on, let's go to the store. He goes, no, nah, we don't have time for that. She goes, yeah, we take 30 minutes. He goes, honey, let me tell you something. Everything in the world takes four hours. You have to decide to go there, you have to get ready to go there, then you have to go there, and then you have to do whatever it is you came to do, then maybe you have to eat or something, and then you have to talk about why you should have eaten somewhere else, and then you have to go home. 
There's nothing in the world that takes less than four hours. That's pretty much how the Milton is. The guy tells me, it'll only take me an hour to do that. I'm like, yeah, mm, four. You know why? Not because he's necessarily wrong, but because by the time he gets the information together, he gets on the site, he puts his stuff together, he does the thing that takes me the half an hour, the hour, and then he updates the system and he tells the client it got done. And blah, blah, blah. Maybe close to four hours, right? Um, so when we're estimating anything of any size, Never try to say that something's less than four hours. Like everything in the world takes four hours. <laughs> so when we're doing quotes and proposals, we don't even use this whole deck. We narrow it down even further. <laughs> the smallest thing we do is a half a day. Half a day. It's kind of small. It takes me just a little bit. Okay, half a day. Right? One day. No, there's no two days. If they think it's more than a day, it goes to three. Why? Because that's when the uncertainty starts kicking in. I want to make sure I'm covered. Even if I'm not doing fixed price, I want to make sure I don't have to come back to that customer later. Oh, and we said it would only take one, but it took three. Okay, so much happier customer when you tell them three and they only took two, right? So I, I do, we do one, and then we do three, and then we do a week. And then the minute they say, well, it'll take more than a week. Well, will it take two weeks? Well, no. Well, are you sure it'll take more than a week? Yes, it's two. Period. That's it. There's not a lot of wiggle room. We're not sitting here worrying about is it two and a half days or three days? Or is it three and a half days or four days? These are the only choices you get. Period. Okay? That's it. And trust me, in the card deck, there are cards that still people will try to pull out. Where is it? Uh, this one's a favorite. This is a, I have absolutely no idea what to say. And then, this is often Michael's favorite, the infinity symbol of, I just, you know, too big for me to even talk about. That means we have to break it down more. Um, now, when I say you're estimating it, I mean everything relating to it. Not how long just the guys have to do it, or how long your developer needs to do the template. I'm talking about everything for that piece. The time you need to plan it, we'll talk about it and design it, and actually do it. And then fix it, because it's never perfect the first time, and we wouldn't even need testing. Test it, then demo it to the client, and then document what you did. That's what's losing your estimate. Another reason why there's nothing less than four hours. Because I don't care that it only took the developer an hour, by the time I look at all the real-time impact of that job, it's probably more like even the smallest thing. Everything is included. So when these guys are giving me the estimate of a day, they're talking about all of this. They're not talking about just themselves. Okay, so you want to you do your quotes at that level. All in. Everything all in. <clears throat> and then you quote the epics. So I estimated effort at a story level. So for each of these, as a front end user, I want to only answer questions that pertain to my situation. So there we had a long conversation about the question algorithm. How is that going to work? And, how are we going to make sure that we give people a chance to skip? And we kind of laid out some stuff and we talked about it. And we came up with a number. And then I went over in progress wise and showed you some of that already. Came up with a number, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Those are not the numbers I give the customer. If I was the, if there was a customer there. Every customer one I had that was a good example. It was under NDA and it couldn't share it, so there you are, you just see an internal one. So, but if I was giving this to a customer, I wouldn't give it to them at that level. I wouldn't tell them that to do the questions is this many days and to do the progress bars is this many days. And I would say, we have evaluated the, wiz the wizard front end, blah, blah, blah. It's going to be this much. You give the client the, client the quote at the epic level. You add it all up and quote that way. So in this case, in this scenario, one, two, three, four, five, six, I might have on my quote six line breakouts for dollars. Now, so you're probably thinking, okay, well, this sounds really kind of interesting and good for a discussion. How do I take that then and stick it in a proposal I can give to a customer? That's going to be different, right? Here's what you do. In the proposal, instead of currently doing what you probably are doing or what we used to do, which is you would list the site will have a blog and the blog will. Blah, 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 blah. You may choose to give your user rules some character if you want. <coughs> The persona kind of approach. Um, some people like this. Some people think it's cheesy. It's up to you. You could just say store owner, blah, blah, blah. Or in this case, we want to make it a little more personal. Bill 
Thomas Weeks is a store owner. He currently uses Joomla 1.5. He has Virtumart 1.1. He wants to upgrade by Joomla 3, but he has no idea what he should do. Right? So he's very busy. He wants to save time. He wants to narrow down the list of the potential carts he should be looking at. He doesn't want to have to go to each of those cart sites and look through their feature list, which are oh, already all formatted differently, and figure out what, which ones might have what he wants. Right? So I describe the user role. Basically, I'm talking about the why. Then I list the epic, the most important epic for that user role. The Joomla Card Advisor will provide an easy to use Q&A quiz that walks Bill, the store owner, through a series of questions about what he needs. The JCA will allow store owners too, and this is where you can go back to bullets, which we all love. Story, 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 story. And then, you know, it's changed the wording, because the wording ought to be, you know, a little bit more, maybe, you know, you have to turn around a little bit. Only answer questions that pertain to their situation. You will put the why there if it's not obvious or it hasn't been made obvious through discussion of the user role or somewhere else in the document. You would put the why there, only answer questions that pertain to their situation so that. But you don't have to if it's been made obvious somewhere else. Okay? But you list all the stories that you quoted separately that make up that epic. And then you do the next epic. JCA results will include a custom PDF report, et cetera, et cetera. So I have epic, and what is in that epic? Epic, what's in the epic? And then the next thing might be the next role. So like if we were doing this for a client, the next role would be the internal admin. All right, Deb, the Polish Geek admin, blah, 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 blah. Lots to do this, and such, cetera, et cetera. And then we list the epics that apply to that feature. And then at the end, like I said, what you would get at the end of the thing where you call up the pricing is something that just says produce wizard front end. Like, you know, price ranges are great. I love price ranges. I don't like to give an exact number. I'll usually say between this and this, which usually you will have gotten a good feel for if you do the estimating the way I talked about. Okay? So again, to recap the quote process, you figure out who the user rules are. Focus on the most vital ones. Absolutely most vital ones. And once it, if they don't succeed, it doesn't matter. The rest of it doesn't count. Create and discuss all the epics and the user stories. Use those to have your conversations with your clients. Then estimate those stories using something like a planning poker kind of approach, or you know, whatever you're comfortable with. But I really think the planning poker is, in a lot of ways, fun also. Generates good team conversation. And then you quote at the epic level. Now, people have fears about doing it this way. Some of the fears are things like, oh, we're going to overlook something. I will, who here has put out a quote or proposal that didn't overlook something? Nobody, right? Well, it happens. The beauty of doing it this way is you've already focused on the why, and you aren't bringing things down in such a way that the client is expecting black and white binary perfection out of the list. And there's room for negotiation. Um, I actually find that, yeah, maybe you overlook something, but you know what, if you spend enough time with the client talking about why they want to do this, and, and they see that you really are embracing their vision of what they want to build, and what they want the site to do, or the app to do, or whatever, um, they'll usually tell you all the important stuff. Usually. Maybe you think it's weird. Maybe you think you're just going to feel odd to do it that way. I will remind you again about the people from SeaWorld. Yeah, it was weird back in 1961 to do that. Write a story in there, a visit to the marine park. And it actually was all like first person. It talked about the beautiful silver bubbles coming from the whale, et cetera, et cetera. It put the people who were on the decision committee in a place that they could actually say, we get it. You understand what you're building. You understand why you're building it. You understand the kind of joy it's going to bring to families and visitors, et cetera. And you know, people remember storytellers. People remember how you made them feel, right? Heard that saying before? Um, by the way, that really is a real burger. <laughs> That's a burgushi from Cowfish Grill. Weird sandwich, if you ask me. Um, some people are afraid that they'll miss out on revenue. I would say you should be a consultant, not a commodity. You should not be working with a client in a way that they can just take, you know, their conversation with you and just go somewhere else. Um, and you know, the customers who do that, frankly. Not the ones that you know we want to work with, right? We want to work with the ones who are not looking for cheaper 
We want to look for the ones who are looking for the value of the, the thought process we put behind what we build and the, the consulting attitude of what we bring to the table. And then, yeah, customers like fixed price. So the example that I told you about where I said, I have the most important user, and I've decided what is the most important pivotal epic thing that matters to that user, if I'm pushed for a fixed price, that's the one I'll fix price. And we'll spend the most time specking that out. And I'll fix price that one. And then I'll get ranges for the rest. Because you know what? If the customer thinks we're too expensive for the first one, that less important stuff obviously isn't going to matter. Why should I spend all my time breaking that out and specking that out in detail? When to do the stuff that is the most important for the most critical role, if they decide the price isn't right, then we should part ways. Not putting more energy into it on our side or theirs. So that's usually what we'll do. We'll get a fixed price on that. We get ranges. I mean, people want to have an idea, but the fixed price is only committed to on that first piece. And just to kind of close with a thought about stories, it kind of, kind of ties to the proposal of thought too. The fairy tales are more than true, not because they tell dragons exist, but they tell, because they tell us that dragons can be beaten. So by giving the client your proposal in this kind of format, you are showing them that you can take their project and beat the dragon. Thank Thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs>
we decided we weren't even going to do them. External ex uh, administration, for right now, I'm not going to build that. I'm going to see how many of these cart vendors are willing to you know, provide me information back. I know several of them that I work with are pretty good already about going through and looking at my sheet and saying, ah, by the way, did you know we added this new feature that you didn't catch? Okay, I missed that in the change log. Um, some of them are pretty good about it, but some of them are probably not going to be. Or maybe it might take them a while. So I, we've decided to table that. You know, and, that would, and if I was on the other side of, of being a client and was actually paying money to have someone build this for me, then you know, that, would, that would be something that, that I'd want to know. I'd want to know, ooh, that, you know what? That's not really important enough to me. Whereas the really big number at the top, you know, if, if you haven't at least broken it down on some level for a larger project, then they just see the big number. Maybe they just get scared and bail, and you don't even have that open conversation about, oh, you know what, I don't really need external administration. We can build that later. Well, you make a good point, too, and I, I'm thinking of it along the lines of what I do is five to maybe $15,000. So, yeah. You know, I'm, yeah, if I was doing a $50,000 website, then your approach it makes a lot more sense. Yeah. It, it depends on, you know, how complicated what you're doing is and everything else. I'm a big fan. I have a second session today on e-commerce, by the way, and a lot of the comment is understand what you don't know, right, the detail kind of stuff, um, because it will get you. You know, it's called, by the way, by the way, it's get you. Oh, we're supposed to do a giveaway, right? Thank you for reminding me about the giveaway. Okay, so, um, I think we'll do... Well, you know what? You had a good conversation with me. You can choose whether you want to be the red component winner or the t-shirt winner. I know whichever one you don't get. You know, we'll award to someone else. Go ahead and fill in your name and your email and that sort of stuff. If you don't know what it is, the red component is a free six month, I think, subscription to their service. Is it 12? Awesome, even better, twice as good. Um, and then the other one's a t-shirt, which is it the t-shirt with the Joomla thingy? Oh, that one. Oh, okay. Well, cool. I remember one of those. Yes, you had a question. I was going to ask if there's a way to adapt this estimation process for like iterative development, like ongoing tasks that are like forever. They're going to go like an ongoing, like a service contract or something. Um. Yeah, you might actually want to get more into agile then and look at like the Kanban kind of approach, which is all about ongoing processes and services and maximizing those, you might want to do that then. Yeah, I've looked at that and it's like, it's, you're caught in this loop and it's, it's yeah. good, but it's also like terrifying. <laughs> it is, <laughs> it is, which is, which is why, you know, we went, we, we all went to this boot camp and we did this class all together. So we had all the same experience and the same language and everybody came out of the class with the same thing, which was really helpful for getting the team to shift, right? But it's not an immediate thing. It's not like we came back in the very next week. We we're like, woohoo, we're 100%. You know, and, and it, and we're adapting pieces as we go. You have exactly. to, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you. And I think you have asked me a couple of questions, so we'll give you okay. the other one. Yeah. So I know we're right at 12:30, and 12:30 is lunch. So I don't want to stand in the way of anybody okay. and food. If anyone has any questions, or what's my business card? You can come in here and we'll talk about that. Um, I do have another session today at, I think, 3.30 on e-commerce requirements. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Woo!